In Mark chapter 8, verses 1 through 6, there's a passage of Scripture that we're going to talk about. And you probably know it, but you didn't know you knew it. The Bible said, Mark 8, beginning of verse 1, In those days the multitude being very great and having nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples to him and said to them, I have compassion on the multitude because they have now continued with me three days and have nothing to eat. And if I send them away hungry to their own houses, they will faint on the way. For some of them have come from afar. Then his disciples answered him, How can one satisfy these people with bread here in the wilderness? And he asked them, How many loaves do you have? And they said, seven. So he commanded the multitude to sit out on the ground. And he took the seven loaves and gave thanks and broke them and gave them to his disciples to set before them. And they set them before the multitude and they ate. Let's pray. Father, thank you today for your love and your grace. Thank you for every member and every visitor and every attender that's here today. Lord, you be our preacher and our teacher, and we'll praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. There are two facts that, that come to light in this passage of Scripture. One is, man does not live by bread alone. And the other is, man cannot live without bread. So you need to understand that. Jesus recognized both of these facts by the miracle of the feeding of the multitude that he not only declared himself to be the bread of life for the souls of men, but also the provider of the bread for the bodies of men. In our today's text, we have a story of Jesus feeding 4,000. But there seems to be confusion by the leisure reading of the Scriptures with the feeding of the 5,000. These are two different stories. Jesus fed the 5,000 with some loaves and fishes that a little boy had in his, in his bag lunch. These, these are the loaves that the disciples had that he said, I want you to give to the people. In this miracle occurred in the region of Decapolis on the eastern shore of the Sea of Galilee. Jesus, as Jesus taught and as he preached, the crowd continued to grow larger and larger until there was such a vast, attitude, a vast group of, of followers and listeners that it, was, it grew into kind of like what used to have years ago, count meetings. Now, most of y'all don't know what a count meeting is, but uh, uh, if you've ever been to one, then you don't forget it. So, many had come bringing their lunch, and then they had stayed three days, and they didn't have anything else to eat. They had eaten all they had. So three days, these people held on, sleeping on the ground at night, eagerly pressing around Jesus in the, in the daytime, listening to him teach and preach and share the, the gospel. During these three days, the people were exhausted. They had exhausted their body and they had exhausted their food, and yet they did not leave. These people were hungry, but they were hungry for more than just bread. These were Gentiles who had never witnessed anything like what was going on in the ministry of Jesus. So Jesus expressed concern uh, about the, the, to the disciples about the crowd. He said, because we're so far away that if I send them back, they won't make it. They'll, they'll die or they'll fall over to the side. Now, the disciples must have remembered the 5,000, Jesus feeding the 5,000. That was, that was 5,000 plus the women and the children. So there was probably somewhere between uh, 10 and, and 15 or 20,000 people in that story of the 5,000. So he wanted to do the same thing for these Gentiles. So they obviously did not think that it could happen Sometimes we have short memories. And so they responded to Jesus, we don't have anything to feed these people with. And Jesus said, what do you have? And they said, we've got seven loaves of bread. And Jesus said, okay, 
I want you to just give me that bread. And he took the bread and he blessed it and he broke it and gave it to the disciples. And the Bible says that he fed, they fed the entire 4,000 people plus. The great truth in this experience is Jesus is both the satisfier and the provider. Now, I want you to listen to what I'm saying. Jesus is both the satisfier and the provider. He satisfies our hunger spiritually, and he multiplies our potential ministry. So, he is the master of multiplication. He takes what we bring to him, what we bring to him, and he multiplies it to meet the needs of the people in the world around us. He can take our little and multiply it into a lot. Boy, that's so awesome. That is so awesome. The problem was that these, these, these 4,000 people didn't have anything to eat, and the disciples were looking at it from a human perspective, and Jesus was looking at it from an eternal perspective. You see, the disciples focused on what they did not have, and Jesus wanted them to focus on what they did have. Now, listen to what I'm telling you. The disciples were like a bunch of people in this church. We're so busy focusing on what we don't have that we forget that Jesus is the multiplier of what we do have. Man, I'm telling you, that's, that's good. They, I had a little story. One day there was a little old boy came back, came home from school, and he, his father was there. And he said, Dad, I think I failed my math test today. And his daddy said he wanted to teach the little boy a lesson about being positive. And he said, son, don't talk like that. He said, you need to learn to be positive. He said, all right, Dad, I'm pretty positive I failed my math test today. <laughs> that's, where, that's where these disciples were. They were pretty positive that they didn't have any way to feed these 4,000 people. You see, the thing about it is... As long as you and I are willing to focus on what we don't have, we'll never be able to realize the plenty that God has got for us to enjoy life with. And so today we're going to talk about giving what you can using what you have. There are some great people that changed the world that didn't have what you and I would think would be the tools to do it with. For an example, Shakespeare didn't have a typewriter or a word processor. Einstein didn't know a computer chip from a potato chip. The Apostle Paul honeycombed the Roman Empire with churches without the assistance of a mission board. And David decked Goliath without the help of George Foreman. Christ replied, to his disciples' negative statement this way, how many loaves do you have? Jesus was saying simply this, I'm not interested in what you don't have. Tell me what you do have. Don't tell me what you can't get, and I'll show you what I've got and what I can do. And that's the thing he wants from us. He wants us to, to speak our faith. He wants us to speak our faith. When Jesus when Jesus put their little in his hands, it came out enough to, to feed 4,000 plus people. And that's pretty awesome. The, the disciples grossly overestimated their poverty. They failed to look at their resources. They felt that they had nothing, but, but when they didn't realize that when they had Jesus, they had more than enough. I want you to listen to me. I don't know. You may be going through something today. I don't know what it is. And you, you may think that you're, you're about to go under. But let me tell you something. When you've got Jesus, you've got more than enough. Huh? His word, this book says that we're more than conquerors through Christ who loves us. You know what more than a conqueror is? We win before the game starts. Yeah. Amen. Amen.
I like, I like telling Satan to just go ahead and give it your best shot, big boy. Yeah. And he gave me some pretty good shots in the last four years, but you know what? I'm standing up here preaching God's Word. Amen. Glory to God and thank you, Jesus. Woo! Well, here's the deal that I want you to, to talk to you about today. You said, well, preacher, you don't preach half that sermon. No, I hadn't. No, I hadn't. I just chased a rabbit for the first half. <laughs> the great truth of the miracle that we've talked about so far is that we need to start dwelling on what we have in Jesus. He is the master of multiplication. There are at least three areas of my life and your life where this truth needs to be applied. First of all, Jesus can multiply our talents. Second, He can multiply our tithes. And third, He can multiply our testimony. Man, now listen, you need, you need to just bear down on this. Put that in your mental notebook pad. First of all, we need to give him our talents. He can multiply our talents and maximize our talents to where, to where we can touch this world around us. Ken was talking about touching this world around us. Twelve words. No more, no less. But they sum up the message of this miracle. The real question in life is this. What will you do with what you have? What will you do with what you have? All of God's servants who have been privileged to accomplish great things for Him because they have been painfully aware that their weakness and their inadequacies were in their life. All of, listen, all of us have areas of weakness in our life. You've heard me say it. All of us have blind spots. All of us have blind spots. And I promise you, Satan knows what it is. Hmm? Now, you listen to what I'm going to tell you. Now, you ladies may not like this, but every man has a Delilah. Are you listening to me? Every man has a Delilah. So you have to choose where you love God more than you do that Delilah in your life. Huh? Amen. Listen. I promise you on the authority of the Word of God, you will not commit adultery before the Holy Ghost of God gives you conviction about it. You're going to have to push aside the Holy Spirit conviction to be able to sin on purpose. Amen? Say you're right, preacher. Okay. Some of you hurt your jaw. But you see, most of us understood that if we gave what we had to the Lord, He would multiply it and give it back to us. Moses was a great example trying to, to what I'm trying to tell you today. Moses was timid. He, was, he, was, he stuttered. He had a tremendous inferiority complex. When God called him to lead the children of Israel out of Egyptian bondage, he had a multitude of reasons that he couldn't do it, and he gave them all. He told God all of it. And God said to Moses, what is that you have in your hand? And Moses said, it's my shepherd's staff. And the Lord told him to throw it on the ground. And he threw it on the ground and it turned into a serpent. Then God told him to pick it back up. Now look, I promise you it was easier to throw that sucker on the ground than it was to pick up a serpent. Wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I, let me just be honest with you. Me and snakes don't get along too good. Amen. You know, somebody say, well, that's a black snake. That's a good snake. Yeah, he, he's thinking to be good in just a minute. Because I'm going to chop his head off. And so God said to Moses, pick that serpent up. And Moses obeyed, and he reached down to pick it up, and it became his shepherd's staff again. And God is simply saying to Moses, look, you use what you have, and I'll make a miracle out of it. You use what you have, and I'll make a miracle out of it. I remember when God called me to preach. 
Now, most of you know that I didn't know anything about the Bible. I didn't, I didn't know enough of Scripture to, to, to chew up and spit out. And God called me to preach after Linda got saved. And I said, Lord, I don't think I can do this. And he said, yes, you can. And then so, and, and I, I had a preacher friend of mine, and he wanted me to ride, me and Linda ride down to Graceville, to Florida Baptist, because he wanted to talk to the dean about going, in, uh, enrolling in that school. And so they were the prospects, and so the deans had them the, the easy chairs sitting right in front of his desk. Me and Linda were sitting in the, in the back of the room back there in those hard chairs, you know, because we, we wasn't special. We were just coming along for the ride. And the dean poured out of everything that he was spilling out, all this stuff to this preacher and his wife. And, and all of a sudden, he said, is that something you'd be interested in? Out of nowhere, I said, yes, that's something I'm interested in. Linda's eyes got big as two boiled eggs. <laughs> we went back home. We had, a, we had, a, had just built a new home that hadn't made but two payments on it. And so, the, that Dean, I mean, the, uh, the, yeah, the Dean told me, he said, you can't enroll yet. I said, why not? He said, because school's already started. And he said, if you're going to enroll, you have to enroll by Friday. Well, that was Monday. And he said, you've got to have approval from your church before you can do it. Well, that had to be done Wednesday. And so, I said, okay, we can do that. We got home, and Linda said, what are you going to do? I said, we're going, we're going to Florida. And we didn't have any place to live. So I slept in. I went by myself to enroll and slept in my car. Came back and got Linda and, I, and our two children, and we didn't have enough money. So my daddy borrowed a cow truck, and they put hay over the cow poop and our furniture on top of it. And we went down to Graceville. I went to the school. And I said, I don't have a place to live. So they put us in, in public housing. And that was fun. Yeah. So anyhow, we had a place to live. And we didn't have any money. I came home one day from school, and Linda met me at the door. And I knew we wasn't fixing to have a picnic. She had that look, you know what I mean? She said, you're going to have to do something. I said, what do you want me to do? She said, we don't have any money. We got two kids in there that don't have any milk or anything to eat. And I said, well, I said, we just trust God to take care of it. And that day, the mailman ran, and I went out there, and there was an envelope. And I opened up that envelope, and there was a check in there for $50. And I went running back to the house, squalling halfway back. And I told Linda, I said, look here. I told you God would take care of this. And so we went to the grocery store. We didn't have much money, so we went out to the dairy. And you could, at, back then, you could, if you were a student, you could buy raw milk for 25 cents a gallon. So we bought two gallons of milk for 50 cents. And we went back and went to the grocery store. And Linda bought enough of stuff. And we, we ate. On Friday, we could eat chicken. The rest of the time, we ate beans and cornbread or turnips and cornbread. And that's, I guess that's how I got so in love with cornbread. That's all I had to eat. You say, preacher, what does that story have to do with us? It has everything to do with you. Because I got a high school GED diploma, graduated from college and graduated from seminary. And I've been preaching for the last 50 something years. You see, the, the moral of what we're studying here today is simply this you give what you've got to God, and He'll multiply it. You give what you've got to God, and He'll multiply your substance, He'll multiply your talents, He'll multiply your ministry. You see, the problem that most of us have, we start talking about what we don't have and what we can't do 
instead of realizing that we've got Jesus and we've got it all. Listen, I don't know how to tell you this. When you invited Jesus Christ to come into your life and give you sins and make you a Christian, let me tell you what. God moved in. He came in in the person of the Holy Spirit of God and He lives in you. And the Word of God said He'll never forsake you nor leave you. And what you have in you is the resurrection power of God living in you in the person of the Holy Ghost. Man, I'm telling you the truth. That's good stuff. I just think sometimes we let the enemy blank us out to who we are in Christ Jesus. Man, I, listen, we are somebody. Now, now, I want you to listen to what I'm going to tell you. Because I tell you, when God showed me this, it was absolutely awesome. He didn't make enough of bread to feed 4,000 people out of nothing. He took seven loaves of bread and multiplied it. You understand? When God made Adam, he didn't make him out of nothing. He reached down in a mud hole and made him out of dirt. You understand? When God made Eve, he didn't make her out of nothing. He made her out of a rib that came from Adam. You understand what I'm saying? When God's going to use you, he's not going to use you out of nothing. He's going to take you and mold you and make you and use you for his glory. Woo! Listen to me carefully. I want you to get this. You are a miracle in the making. You are a miracle in the making. Hmm? Amen. You see, here's the thing. Jesus took what was available to him and turned it into a miracle. Amen. You say, preacher, what are you so happy about? Because he took me when I was a deep, in a deep and miry pit, and he put my feet on solid ground. And I want you to listen to me today. If you're here and you're saved by faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ, you are a miracle in the making. The second thing is, that was just the first point, and we're out of time already. Not quite. Mother Teresa. The Bible says that Jesus multiplies our gifts. Mother Teresa of Calcutta, India, became an international symbol of faith and real success. Once she had a dream to build an orphanage, but her superior said, what do you have? How much money do you have? And this is what she said. I have three pennies and a dream from God to build an orphanage. Her superior said, Mother Teresa, you can't build an orphanage with three pennies. With three pennies, you can't do anything. Mother Teresa looked at her superiors and smiled, and she said, but with God and three pennies, I can do anything. Amen. You just take your three pennies and put them in the hands of God and see what you get. Listen, let me just tell you something about giving. If you can't give 10%, give 7 And if you can't give 7 give 5 And if you can't give 5 give 3 You say, preacher, what do you say? Listen, you have to start somewhere. You have to start somewhere. You start your giving somewhere. You, know, you, you, you may not be able to start off giving 10%. But I tell you what. God may bless you enough that you're going to start giving 20. You understand? You just take what you have and you give it to God. And you watch Him increase your finances. You see, the devil talk you into believing that you can't give anything. That you can't afford to give anything. Well, you just start showing the devil. You just give him your dollar every Sunday. See what God does. He said, Preacher, I don't have a dollar. Give him 50 cents. Hmm? Start where you are. Start where you are. Now, now listen, I, I understand. I, I understand some of you came out of a church where 
the preacher would beat you in the head every Sunday back giving. You didn't want to give because it wasn't fun to give. It wasn't enjoyable to give. Because the preacher told you if you don't give it, God's going to take it. Huh? You know why you gave? You gave out of fear. You gave out of fear. There's no joy in giving out of fear. I don't want you to give to this, to this, to this, to the Lord through this church ministry out of fear. I want you to give because you're committed to the Lord Jesus. And you want him to bless you and you want him to make and multiply your talents and your finances and your abilities. That's what I want you to give for. And so, the thing about it is, is this. There's so many things that you could be a part of by just simply giving. You could be a part of our preschool ministry by just giving. You could be a part of our nursery ministry by just giving. You could be a part, while all these chairs are empty right here, is when all these youth left and go over there to the youth, to the youth ministry in the old, old building. You can be a part of that. You can be a part of our missionary endeavor in Ghana by simply giving. You can be a, far, a part of our food pantry by simply giving. You don't have to come down here every other Tuesday night and give out food. You can give. You don't have to go to Ghana. You can give. You say, well, preacher, I can't do all that. Well, listen, start where you are. Start where you are. I remember a story one time about a young man. And his daddy said, your brothers are at war. And I want you to take this, this bag lunch here. And I want you to, to, to take it over there and give them to your brothers. And see how they do it. So he got a cert bucket. And he put some cornbread and collard greens and fried chicken in it. You say, preacher, that's not in the Bible. No, that's in Clifton chapter 7. <laughs> now, none of you remember, but I remember when I took my lunch to school in a cert bucket. Huh? And let me tell you, I, I'm going to be honest with you. If you had collard greens in there when you opened it up, you better open it up outside. Because somebody's going to think you got a sick stomach. <laughs> collard greens don't smell real good when they enter. In a cert bucket. How many of you eat collard greens? Oh, yes. Yeah. See, some of y'all don't eat collard greens. You you just eat beans. You eat white beans in a roll. Lord, have mercy. Let me tell you what I believe. When we get to the marriage feast of the Lamb, he's going to have a big old pound of cornbread bigger than the top of this thing right here and enough of fried chicken. Woo! So, so David's dad said, I want you to take this over there and give it to your brothers and see how they do it. Well, David got over there, as you know, and his brothers were all hunkered down behind something or another. And Goliath was out there in the, in the, in the middle ground, screaming and hollering and cussing the Jews. He challenged them every day, send me a man. And David looked at his brothers and he said, why aren't y'all going? He said, why, why aren't you out there in, in the name of the Lord, God of glory? Why aren't you going? And they said, shut up. Shut up. You'll make him mad. He may come over here. David said, I'll do it. He said, I'll do it. You know what he did? He took what he had and used it for God's glory. And you know what happened? You know the story. He took a sling and a rock and he slung it. And the only place it could hit that would have destroyed Goliath because of all of his armor and everything was right between his eyes. That rock sailed directly where God wanted it to go, hit him right there, and Goliath fell over dead. And his brothers saw what he had done. And they all started hollering and shouting. And they got their swords and took off. And they ran the army out of, away from them. Why? All oh, because one guy, one youngster, 
took what he had and used it for God's glory. You understand what I'm saying? Listen to me. I promise you that you have something that you can use for God's glory. We're living in a world that's divided. They're looking for some kind of hope, some kind of peace, some kind of joy, some kind of forgiveness. And you know what? We have the answer. We have the answer. You say, preacher, I don't know enough of Scripture to go out and tell somebody about Jesus. Listen, that's a bald-faced lie. You don't have to be a theologian to tell somebody about Jesus. You just tell him what he did for you. That's all. You just tell him what he did for you. I just shared my testimony with that, with that black lady that was driving an Uber. That's when, she, that's when she turned the steering wheel loose, and I thought, Lord, I shouldn't have told her that. But you know what? Before I got out of that Uber cab, whatever they call cars, I guess, and uh, I got an opportunity to pray with her. Hmm? Never seen her before in my whole life. Probably never see her again in my whole life. But I tell you what, one day I'll see her in heaven. Amen. And I'll know who she is. You say, how you know you're going to know? Because the Word of God says we're going to be known as we're known. Hmm? So here's my challenge today. Take up your little rock. Use your little sling. And slay the enemy in somebody's life. I don't have a doubt that you know somebody that's not in church today. I don't have a doubt you know somebody that may not know Jesus today. You say, well, I got some friends that got hurt in church. Well, tell them come out here. They can heal up. Hmm? But you have to warn them first. So I want you to come to church with me, but I need for you to know the preacher's crazy. That way they won't be caught off guard when they come in. <laughs> Use what you have where you are for God's glory. You say, preach where you start. Right here. If you're not saved, I plead with you today. Give your life to Jesus. Let's stand up. Heads bowed, hands up. Said out loud with me, Father, your word is true. Give me the faith and the courage to stop focusing on what I don't have and to start praising you for what I do have. Father, use what I do have for your honor and your praise and your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.